Welcome everyone. My name is Reverend Karen Hutt and I'm Vice President for Student Formation and Vocation and Community Engagement. And we have with us tonight all kinds of folks. Alums are here, friends, new friends, donors, and most importantly, our students. And I invite you as a way of being in community with one another to drop your name and your location in the chat so that we can have a sense of the breadth of locations and the landscapes of which we are covering united all around the country and here, particularly in the Twin Cities, to give us a sense of being together in community, whether it's virtual or if it's in person there on campus. Our faculty favorite lecture series is a time when we invite our faculty to do what they do best, and that's to offer their gifts of teaching, instruction, and guidance, and give us a glimpse of what happens in the classroom. Our hope is that you'll not only have your intellect tickled tonight, is that you'll also have a chance to see the wonder of the educational experience of United. And it's now my privilege to ask uh, student uh, Ethan Asters, who's currently uh, working on an MA in religion and theology to introduce Kyle, Dean Roberts. Aster? Absolutely. Thank you, Karen. It is a joy and an honor to be here and introduce Dean Roberts tonight at this installment of the United Faculty Favorite Lecture Series. As Karen, you did say, my name is Ethan Asters. I'm a second year distance learner. Uh, at United pursuing an MA in religion and theology. And I've had the privilege of taking a number of classes with the Dean Roberts over my course of study. And I have to say, it's been fantastic. It's been a wonderful experience. Dean Roberts has been an advocate for me throughout my time at United, beginning with my first semester in his religious and theological interpretation course. United is filled with so many gifted students. Some of you are here, um, a lot of you are graduates here as well. And it really can be overwhelming at times, especially, at least for me, when returning to the classroom after a number of years away. And so I can remember feeling the anxiety about my own ability to interpret various traditions as well as articulating my own position. And I remember upon receiving feedback on my first written assignment um, from Dean Roberts, um, it completely alleviated the anxiety that I had by affirming my writing ability um, and the approach that I was taking. And this moment has empowered me to feel like I was where I belong and has also served me in each class ever since. I think Dean Roberts is thoughtful with his students, always looking to support their learning process. I think he has the rare skill of presenting lectures and inviting conversation in a disarming and curious way that invites questions. And in my experience, he has been able to make the most complex theological and ethical presentations accessible, even somebody like me. So from a distance learning perspective, Dean Roberts has put together, I think, a comprehensive structure for his classes that cultivates a robust learning environment for the synchronous students, um, but also asynchronous students as well for those students in person and those um, like myself that are distance. And I think this consistency has proven invaluable for me as I've attempted to balance coursework with full-time ministry, I recently went through the relocation process, and then everything that comes with being a first-time parent that I'm still in the midst of. Um, Dean Roberts has not only been influential in the classroom for me, but also in my ministry context. And as a minister, doing my best to walk alongside my congregation um, in Birmingham, Alabama, which is a little bit different than Minnesota, um, I've been supported by Dean Roberts and provided room to process through the unique challenge that I face in my context. Being faithful to my vocational call has often been isolating for me, and yet United has proven to be a community of belonging. And a great deal of that has to do with Dean Roberts. For that, I am forever grateful. So thank you all again for the honor of letting me be here and introduce one of our faculty favorites, Dean Kyle Roberts. Thank you so much, Ethan. It's an honor to be introduced by you and uh, to hear Karen start us off. And I just wanna 
thank Cindy Beth Johnson for her uh, wonderful idea to put on this series of lectures to showcase our uh, wonderful faculty here. And even I get a chance to do something. And so thank you for, for uh, allowing me this opportunity um, to share some, some thoughts and research and uh, on a topic that I've uh, found very intriguing over the years in my theological work and career in teaching eschatology one of those fancy theological words uh, that you learn very quickly when you uh, begin seminary um, has a, a quite a history in terms of how it's approached and what it means, how we think about issues of life after death. And I'll say a little bit about that, but this is the, the plan for the next number of minutes we have. I'm going to ask a question. What is eschatology? It's not a disease. It's a, the a theology. Um, is it a map or is it a promise? And we'll take a quick glance at beliefs in the U.S. on uh, issues pertaining to the afterlife. And then we'll look at judgment and reward as it is portrayed or pictured uh, in the Bible and beyond. A very uh, cursory glance at some of the material that you find in the Bible and that impacts and shapes people's theological beliefs related to what happens after, um, after we die. Um, questions around the so-called intermediate state and purgatory and resurrection. And, and then we'll end with some reflection on religion and the management of the anxiety of death through uh, reflections on a, a thinker that I've grown to very much appreciate uh, named Ernest Becker. But let's begin with the question, eschatology, is it a map or is it a promise? Occasionally, as a professor, uh, when I first started out um, teaching, I would get these random letters in the mail with bulky uh, envelopes, and I'd open them up thinking, oh, this will be interesting. I'm looking forward to seeing what's, what's there. And uh, invariably, they would be someone's prognostications or projections about what the end of the world is going to be like, and they want professors everywhere to, uh, to be in on their secret understanding of how things are going to shape out. Um, and, so, um, and, and so I would just wanted to give you a quick example of if you go online, you can find these end-of-the-world chronologies. I was joking with a faculty colleague that I should say this is the outline for my discussion for tonight, um, but it's really not. It's it's somebody's uh, wonderings, considerings of their interpretation of the Bible and what it means for uh, how the end of the world is going to come about. And here's another one. We have the time of the end and the day of the Lord and uh, all kinds of interesting things going on here on this timeline and so many people approach in uh, Christian thinking and practice, many people approach eschatology as a kind of map, a roadmap for the future, how things are going to play out. And they might be reading the newspaper with a view to how things are going to unfold uh, in relation to how they interpret, say, the, the book of Revelation, the letter of Revelation at the end of the Bible. Um, that's what I would call a map, a roadmap approach to eschatology. I tend to think of eschatology more along the lines of a promise, a promise about hope. Um, eschatology, Jürgen Moltmann, one of my favorite theologians in his book, important groundbreaking book called The Theology of Hope, says that eschatology means the doctrine of the Christian hope, which embraces both the object hoped for and also the hope inspired by it from first to last, and not merely in the epilogue, Christianity is eschatology, is hope, forward-looking and forward-moving, and therefore also revolutionizing and transforming the present. The eschatological is not one element of Christianity, but it is the medium of Christian faith as such, the key in which everything in it is set, the glow that suffuses everything here in the dawn of an expected new day. So eschatology, not so much a road map of how things will, will how, how history will unfold in relation to a particular reading of the Bible, but rather a promise that the God of goodness and love and grace uh, will be with us as history moves forward, uh, drawing us into uh, greater and greater uh, fullness of God's love. 
That's the promise. The Pew Forum uh, comes out, of course, every now and then with fresh readings on what people believe uh, about religious topics. In 2021, they came out with um, another iteration of belief in heaven and hell. Now, they didn't actually define in this one what heaven means or hell means. They just said, do you believe in heaven? Do you believe in hell? Do you not? And so forth. And in this uh, survey, 73% of all adults in the U.S. believe in heaven. 62% of all U.S. adults believe in hell. 92% of all U.S. Christian adults believe in heaven. 79% of all U.S. Christian adults believe in hell. 88% of all U.S. Christian mainline Protestants believe in heaven. And a lower number, 69% of all U.S. Christian mainline Protestants believe in hell. Just some interesting numbers. I think it's important to take kind of a cultural, uh, cultural uh, temperature to see what, what people are thinking and believing. Um, of course, again, in this sort of undefined concept. One six in Americans do not believe in any afterlife at all. 61% uh, a majority believe in both heaven and hell. 13% believe only in heaven. 1% believe only in hell. That's a really interesting uh, number, isn't it? Um, those may not be people you want to spend a whole lot of time with um, if they only believe in hell. 26%, nearly a, over a quarter of U.S. adults believe in neither heaven nor hell and so forth. So make of that what you will, but I think it's important to note that uh, this is a, a prominent belief in people's mindsets and people's psyches in terms of the afterlife. And our afterlife beliefs, of course, are formed and shaped in large part by our religious traditions and the teachings that we receive uh, within our religious traditions, but they're also shaped and formed by popular culture. In the medieval age, of course, Dante's Divine Comedy was uh, really influential in shaping uh, people's images, conceptions, understandings of heaven, hell, uh, purgatory. It's uh, composed of three parts, the Inferno, the Purgatorio, the Paradiso, or hell, purgatory, and heaven. The work draws upon the important uh, theologian Thomas Aquinas's theology. Sometimes uh, the work, the Divine Comedy, is called Aquinas in verse, a literary approach to the theology of Aquinas. And, and there, there are these uh, sketches as well, illustrations that uh, were made um, uh, also to depict aspects of uh, the work. This is someone fair, ferrying souls across, I think, from heaven to hell. Uh, you can't see the souls because they're invisible. Uh, here are some tormented, uh, anguished souls, uh, the devil and demons and so forth. A vivid imagination put to work in conceptualizing what the afterlife involves or entails. Long before Dante, however, there were the so-called apocryphal texts texts which did not quite make it into the biblical canon of the 66 books of the Old and New Testament, or more so if you're a, a Catholic. Um, but uh, we do have these, these other texts, which were a little later, second and third centuries, uh, common era or uh, AD. The uh, Apocalypse of Peter, written in the second century, first half, contain vivid depictions by Jesus of what will happen to the damned for their sins. Specifically, 21 sins were outlined with their corresponding eternal punishments, and that's in uh, stark contrast to a shorter note about the blessed state that the redeemed will receive in the Elysian or experience in the Elysian fields. The Passion of Perpetua, a late second to early third century text, depicts or is perhaps even the autobiography uh, of an imprisoned Christian convert woman, young woman who was awaiting martyrdom and has this vision in which as she climbs a perilous ladder filled with many dangers, uh, climbing it up to heaven and ladder which was guarded by, by a fierce dragon and uh, many, many more details, of course. This is a very brief summary. 
The Acts of Thomas, an early third century text, depicts the story of a Christian convert man who visits St. Thomas's church in India. Uh, uh, not St. Thomas Aquinas, this is the early Thomas um, the church in India. He and his former lover reveal an epiphany of ex experience of hellish, of a hellish afterlife, places of punishment. The text also includes an epiphany of an existence in heaven as well. If you'd like um, a fuller description or depiction of these texts, uh, Bart, Bart Ehrman's book, Heaven and Hell, I don't know if you can see that, um, The History of the Afterlife, which I quote here in the lecture a few times um, and has been very helpful for me in this uh in this research, um, it's a good source to go for a, a good summary of those stories. Of course, in contemporary popular culture, we have many differing depictions, imaginings of what heaven and hell or the afterlife in its various forms of imagining might be like. Um, we've got the, the television show Lost, of course. Uh, which may, in fact, have been the, the entire premise, uh, uh, potentially a uh, rendition of what purgatory could be like. Um, what Dreams May Come is a really interesting film by uh, Robin Williams. Um, and uh, The Good Place, just trying to remember the name of that Joe here, uh, this, this picture on the screen there to, on the left side, um, is a wonderful comedy uh, dealing with ethics and so forth, but uh, really fun and, uh, and creative uh, depiction of the afterlife. Of course, my personal favorite, Can't Go Wrong with the Simpsons. Um, but let's get on to more serious things. Where the hell is hell in the Bible? Where does this image fit and reside and what does it mean? Let's start with all the references to hell in the Old Testament, often called the Hebrew Bible. Um, and yes, that's all of them. Uh, there, there are no explicit, clear, obvious references to, to hell in the Hebrew Bible. What we do have, though, is the term Sheol. Sheol, which occurs 66 times, can mean anything from the grave or the pit, the place of the dead, or even death. In the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the term Sheol is translated Hades. And when you have the word Hades, of course, you think about kind of the Greek concept, the mythological concept of the underworld. And so that gives it a little bit more of a kind of this, this kind of cultural imagining of what is going on with this term Sheol. Uh, just a few examples of this term in the Hebrew Bible in Genesis 37, we've got the story of Jacob and Joseph and Jacob following the Jacob the father following the presumed death of his son Joseph. The text says all his sons and all his daughters sought to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted and said, No, I shall go down to Sheol to my son, mourning. Thus his father bewailed him. I shall go down to death, down to the pit. Right. In Psalm 89, 48, it says, Who can live and never see death? Who can escape the power of Sheol, the power of death? In Isaiah, Sheol beneath is stirred up to meet you when you come. It rouses the shades to greet you. Shades, kind of shadowy, uh, sort of not really existing uh, figures uh, who populated whatever Sheol may have been in the, in the understanding of that time. Uh, the underneath world, uh, all who are leaders of the earth, it raises from their thrones, all who are kings of the nations, all of them will speak and say to you, you have become as weak as we, you have become like us. And so there's Sheol, and then there's also Gehenna, very important in the New Testament, as we'll see, but Gehenna is literally in the Hebrew, a guy, Ben 
Himon, or Valley of the Son of Hinnom. Uh, in Second Chronicles, this is where it makes a dramatic appearance with, in the context of two wicked kings uh, who were known to, to be wicked to uh, uh, people of Israel. And he, Ahaz, made offerings in the valley of the son of Hinnom and made his sons pass through fire according to the abominable practices of the nations whom the Lord drove out before the people of Israel. He sacrificed and made offerings on the high places, on the hills, and under every green tree. And then later on, he, Manasseh, made his son pass through fire in the valley of the son of Hinnom. Practiced soothsaying and augury and sorcery, and dealt with mediums and wizards. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger. The key point there is that Hinnom the valley of the son of Hinnom became associated with the wickedness of these kings, in particular with uh, a child sacrifice. I'll come back to that in uh, a minute. Afterlife in the Hebrew Bible. In Daniel, much later on uh, in the uh, uh, moving in toward the New Testament age, we have uh, the book of Daniel and this statement at that time, Michael, the great prince, the protector of your people shall arise. There shall be a time of anguish such as never occurred since na nations first came into existence. But at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone who's found written in the book, many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. So there's this image now in Daniel, uh, perhaps for the first time in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Bible, of this kind of sense of re resurrection to everlasting life or everlasting judgment. The Jewish scholar Neil Gilman writes about Daniel 12, 1 to 3, in this passage, he says, is not concerned with the resurrection of masses, of masses of Jews, nor with the resurrection of the dead, nor the dead of prior generations, nor is the author concerned with the mechanics of resurrection. He is concerned only with those who died in the persecutions of his day. He is concerned only and specifically with two groups of Jews, the some and the others. These two groups are clearly the pious Jews who died as martyrs and the evildoers who died triumphant in their program of Hellenization and persecution. Here, the motive for resurrection is retribution, only incidentally, it is a matter of God's power. At issue is God's justice. Really important point that this, story, this, this book was written in a time of great persecution of the Jews by Antiochus IV or Epiphanes, sometimes also known. Um, and it was uh, the, the concept of resurrection here as it's developed in Daniel is specifically getting at the question of justice. Is there justice in the world in light of great evil and suffering? And so to summarize in the Old Testament or Hebrew Bible, we have this concepts of Sheol or Hades, death, grave, pit, place of the dead. We've got Gehenna, which is an actual valley south of Jerusalem where child sacrifice was known to have occurred, thought to have occurred came to symbolize great evil and judgment for evil. We don't really have an explicit or consistent description of an afterlife as a place of existence for eternity. We do have the concept of resurrection surfacing as a key theme, but in this kind of collective sense, resurrection of peoples, resurrection of a nation, resurrection of Israel, can these bones live? A justice and judgment is the heartbeat of resurrection. And this is the idea of judgment day or the day of the Lord. God is coming to bring justice for his people. Moving into the New Testament, the concept of hell has um, a lot more prominence in the New Testament. The term Hades, which we also saw that in the Old Testament is the Greek rendering of Sheol, occurs 10 times. In the New Testament, an example in Luke 16, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Uh, Lazarus, the beggar who came to 
the rich man for scraps of food, uh, was outside of his house. Uh, but in Hades, in Hades, the rich man was being tormented. And then the term Gehenna, also in the New Testament, comes directly from that Hebrew uh, guy Ben Hinnom, the valley of the son of Hinnom. Uh, and so when Jesus talks about hell, most of the time, he says Gehenna. There's one term, Tartaro, uh, which is another term that's translated as hell in Second Peter. For if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of deepest darkness to be kept until the judgment. Tartarus, of course, is a Greek, a Greek a mythological god of the underworld. Um, but that then gets translated as hell in the New Testament as well. Some examples of Jesus talking about hell in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, anyone who says you fool will be in danger of the fire of hell. It's Gehenna there. So you will be in danger of the fire or they will be in danger of the fire of Gehenna. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into Gehenna. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to go into Gehenna. Do not, and when he, he's uh, commissioning his disciples to go out and uh, spread uh, the gospel, he says, do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in Gehenna. Ehrman summarizes it as an a place of utter des desolation, a place despised and abandoned by God. Uh, on the other side of the picture, what about heaven? Heaven in the Bible occurs primarily through the term Shemayim 327 times in the Old Testament. It means heaven, the heavens, the sky, the firmament where God and other heavenly beings dwell. In the Hebrew Bible, heaven is not explicitly and certainly not consistently a metaphysical resting place or existing place for the saved, the redeemed, the people of God, and so forth. Heaven is up there. It's the, the, upper, the upper tier of a three-tiered reality. In Judges, as an example, when the cloud, a column of smoke, began to rise out of the city, the Benjaminites looked behind them, and there was a whole city going up in smoke toward the sky, toward the heaven. As they continued walking, another text in Second Kings, walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elijah ascended in a whirlwind into heaven. In the New Testament, heaven is Uranu, or uh, it means heaven, heavens, it can be signs from heaven, powers of the heaven, angels coming to or from heaven. And it can also, heaven can simply mean the skies, the atmosphere. Mark 13, he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens, the skies. Mark 13 again, 31, heaven and earth will pass away. Heaven will pass away? Well, the skies. The atmosphere, but my words will never pass away. Luke 22, then an angel from heaven appeared to him and gave him strength. And while he was blessing them, he withdrew from them and was carried up into heaven. Lots of shades of meaning to this term. Lots of ways it is employed and envisioned um, in these texts. Uh, N.T. Wright suggests that there's a dominant sense in which heaven in the New Testament is, is the control room of God, kind of where the power of God is sort of uh, derived from and then uh, implemented into the world or within history. And there's an important idea in Revelation 21, the new heaven and new earth. I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a voice from the throne saying, see, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his peoples and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more for the first things have passed away. It's a beautiful image of God 
coming down to God's creation, uniting with it, living and dwelling with, with the people uh, in this profound and intimate way and transformative way. And that leads us into the idea of resurrection. And there are key New Testament themes around the concept of resurrection. Jesus himself preached an apocalyptic day of judgment, coming judgment day. Um, as well as the resurrection from or of the dead. And of course, Jesus was re resurrected from the dead by God in the Gospels. Each of the four Gospels has an account of a resurrection of Jesus at the end. And then Paul, the apostle, believed in a bodily resurrection, a resurrection that was based for Paul in, uh, in particular in faith, in Christ. Ehrman, Ehrman points out, I think, interestingly, that for Paul, belief in bodily resurrection is based on faith in Christ. Not so for Jesus. Jesus didn't actually teach, you must have faith in me, and if you do, you will be uh, raised from the dead. Um, and, and so there, there's an interesting development of this concept within uh, the, the biblical literature itself. As, uh, as theologies develop, uh, as, as beliefs are formed and shaped, um, of course, Paul's letters were first chronologically, and so there's a wrinkle there. But um, in any case, uh, I will move on to some major views of the resurrection. Let's just say there are three primary views, and there are many nuances of this. First is literal and, and bodily. This might be the most common popular Christian view, um, that the, the resurrection will be literal, and it will be uh, a resurrection of the body. It was a bodily resurrection for Jesus. It will be a bodily resurrection for those who, um, who are, are raised from the dead um, because of Christ, because of God. Anticipating a future resurrection of believers and either double judgment, meaning there's a heaven and there's a hell, that have some kind of eternal uh, punishment and reward, vice versa, uh, or a salvation of all persons in universalism. Christian universalism. Um, so that's the first and probably most common view. The second view, the mystical and embodied spiritual resurrection, um, is a, a kind of nuancing of the first view um, in which the body is not necessarily physical, corporeal, but mystically spiritual. Um, there is still a literal resurrection in the sense that there is an afterlife. There is a literal afterlife. There will be persistence of consciousness, mind, and some kind of body, but it's not as concrete, perhaps, as in the first view. Uh, the third view, the mythical and symbolic view, suggests that the power of faith to create life out of ashes and the power to which we all have access through faith is what's really in view in the resurrection account, and the resurrection story. And therefore, the story itself does not depend upon a literal rendering, uh, a literal appropriation of their application of the story to how we think about the afterlife itself. That gives rise to the question of the intermediate state, which is what happens when we die? Like right afterward, between death and then resurrection, which for Jesus and other Jews, like the Pharisees at the time of Jesus, were anticipating a resurrection to come within history, not the moment after you die. And so there, what, what's going on in this intermediate state after death or preceding some kind of resurrection, if you hold a literal view of that, there have been many uh, variations of this purgatory is most commonly known in the Catholic tradition, uh, an important concept. Augustine taught some form of it early on in the fourth century, uh, Gregory the Great, a few centuries later, and then purgatory was adopted as a, a Catholic teaching, a doctrine in the late 11th century, um, and became a flashpoint during the Protestant Reformation, of course, because Martin Luther took on the practice of indulgences, uh, selling prayers for the dead to, uh, 
to provide for a, a escape from purgatory and so forth, or a early exit uh, from purgatory. And so that became a huge issue within the Protestant Reformation, of course, or that, that spurred on the Protestant Reformation in, in a sense. And then the question is what's, another question is happening on the individual sense of individual eschatology, what happens during that intermediate state? Um, are souls conscious? Do they have bodies? Are they aware of what's going on? Luther taught a version of soul sleep in which uh, the soul is not aware or conscious. Um, and so it's like in a blink of an eye, you go from death at whatever point in history to uh, awake, being awakened um, at the final judgment of when uh, everyone is resurrected and there are bodies and coming to life and uh, uniting with souls and so forth. So all kinds of interesting speculation about the intermediate state and what's happening there. Um, let me just summarize some major views of a literal afterlife, and then we'll um, want to have some time for questions, thoughts from you all as well. Um, double judgment is the idea that there is a heaven and hell for eternity, that uh, they are metaphysical places or actual kind of places in a sense that are populated with souls or resurrected bodies who are either tormented in hell or blessed for all of eternity. Well, uh, Leibniz, the great enlightenment thinker, said it seems strange that even in the great future of eternity, evil must triumph over good and over the, under the supreme authority of the one who is the sovereign good. After all, there will be many who are called and yet few who are chosen or saved. In more contemporary times, John Stott, the British evangelical theologian, got to a lot of trouble within evangelicalism. When he said, I find the concept intolerable and do not understand how people can live with it without cauterizing their feelings or cracking under the strain of it. Uh, another view is conditional immortality, which is the idea that immortality is not an inherent feature of human nature, but it is rather a gift bestowed on those who will live beyond death because of God's grace. Conditional immortality. And then there's the view annihilationism, which is the view that Stott came to hold himself in response to that emotional uh, problem that he raised. This is the idea that persons who do not enter heaven or the new creation, the new heaven and new earth, will be destroyed, will simply cease to exist because of God's judgment, God's active judgment. And then, lastly, universalism. This is the view that all will be saved because of the grace of God and through the work of God in Christ. Um, this is not pluralism. This is Christian universalism because these views that I'm uh, presenting here today are all within Christian theology, of course. Um, it's kind of a, a, on the, the theology of religions scale, if you were attending uh, Dr. Demian Wheeler's lecture, it's an inclusivist position in terms of a theology of religions, but it is universalist in the sense that the belief is that God's salvation will be universally applicable uh, to all creation, to all creatures, to all of humanity. Some general reflections on all of this. So much of this, as with so much of theology, comes down to interpretation. In real estate, the rule is location, location, location. In theology, it's interpretation, interpretation, interpretation. There is a lot of diversity in the Bible, both in the Hebrew Bible and in the New Testament, on views of heaven, hell, afterlife, judgment, and so forth. There's not a univocal position. There's not a universal view. There are uh, developments and shades and differing perspectives and so forth. There's so much development in the Christian tradition and history and all these views, so many options to draw from. And of course, at the end of the day, no one really knows then what is on the other side. Uh, if you're just looking at the, the kind of historical, biblical, theological traditions that we have available, but there are lots of uh, options, each with their own challenges. So what does all of this fascination with and speculation on the afterlife tell us? Well, 
we know that death is inevitable. And we know that that inevitability creates anxiety and spurs reflection and speculation. Religions, in part, arose in response to and developed in response to that anxiety. And they offer ways for humans to deal with the psychological and existential turmoil and curiosity of conf confronting this fact. Ernest Becker, a thinker that I've been drawn to over, the, over many of these uh, last years, five or six years or so, wrote a very important book called The Denial of Death a number of decades ago. And Becker reflects on this problem of death anxiety. Of course, he was not the only one to do so, but he does so in a compelling way, I think. He says that humans must deal with the existential problem of the knowledge of death. It's a psychological problem. It's an existential problem. It's something that if we were to be consciously thinking about it all the time, it would drive us crazy. And so we deal with it. They, we deal with it in part by engaging in immortality projects by having cultural uh, contributions, by developing culture itself, he thinks is a kind of uh, demonstration or evidence uh, in a sense, uh, or, or, or a, a consequence of this problem of death anxiety. We create things that will last, art, music, beauty, books, not all of them will last, but some of them will. Uh, uh, progeny, children are, kind of can be a, a, an immortality project, a legacy that continues, that continues uh, a part of ourselves on into the world, um, into the future. But religion offers solutions to or responses to death anxiety. They give us stories, symbols. Uh, they give us ways to, to, to imagine what the future will be like after this life? Community, will there be community? Will there be together, togetherness? Will there be love? Um, immortality beliefs can provide healthy respite from death anxiety. So, so those beliefs in an immortal life, in, a, in an eternity, in a continuing of our existence beyond death can be healthy. Immortality beliefs can provide unhealthy responses to death anxiety too. That's, that's the problematic side of this. Because if my beliefs are wrong, and, and if I think they might be wrong because I've been confronted by your beliefs, which are different from mine, maybe fundamentally different from mine, uh, then that can unhinge or unsettle the confidence that I have in my beliefs which themselves are buttresses against this problem of death anxiety. And so you've just unsettled the foundation, the structure that has given me a uh, kind of a peace or contentment in the face of the inevitability of death. So there's a healthy side, there's an unhealthy side. By the way, it's also important to say that the fact that there is this aspect or element of immortality beliefs or thoughts about the afterlife that has a productive value in our emotional and psychological response to the problem doesn't make them wrong or right. It's not a prescriptive uh, result at all. It's a kind of descriptive understanding of how religions can work both for good or for ill. So immortality, is it literal or symbolic? That's a bigger question than all the others that we've mentioned so far. But the, the real issue there is, do we persist? Do we continue on? Do we endure in some way, shape, or form after death uh, or, or not? Is our endurance, is our continuing on uh, through uh, uh, symbolic? Is it through our legacies? Is it through memory that our loved ones and friends have uh, of us and hold about us um, when we are gone? And, and so that's, I think, a fascinating question underneath all of this, one that I cannot definitively answer. Um, few concluding comments here. 
where does this leave us? Let's first acknowledge our uncertainty and the unknown about these, the other side. Let's respect people's varied beliefs and understand that underneath it all is a permeating, rumbling terror resulting in the, our awareness that death is coming for us all eventually. Let's also keep in mind uh, within the Christian context that resurrection and afterlife is central to the Christian tradition, but resurrection and afterlife can be understood in many, many ways. Also, death is not an enemy. Death is not an enemy. I think that's a hopeful way to think about uh, death within the Christian tradition. There is so much hope. There is so much, uh, so much investment in these biblical stories and concepts and ideas that uh, there will be life with God, that what is, is good about life will continue on in some way, shape, or form. The afterlife should never be a substitute for justice now. This is something that James Cone has made, I think, very prominent. Uh, theologically in the black liberation theology tradition that we cannot substitute a uh, a hope in a future after afterlife for caring about and considering and working for justice in the present moment because afterlife ideas and images and theologies can be utilized to uh, to, to delay working for justice in the present moment Thank you. And I think we have some time for questions or comments.